actually I will actually uh, display a question, and it will be followed by an answer as well. So you would actually immediately know. Uh, mm -hmm. who is the first so whoever actually answers first they the first few may not actually have any answers at all <laughs> because people probably might haven't been joining they're still working uh, but because we actually have a pretty long program so that's why we started off early so let's uh, start our um, quiz okay. So the uh, this is the World Anesthesia Day quiz at uh, today, 16th October, 2020. And um, starting off with the first question of the day. Um, this is a normal uh, anesthesia workstation, which all of you are actually aware of. And the question is very simple here. It's related to the volatile anesthetic, the anesthetic gases. You see two vaporizers on the machine, the sevoflurane vaporizer and the desflurane vaporizer. The question, the first question is, which volatile anesthetics of these two was introduced first? Okay, so you only have uh, 30, 30 seconds uh, to actually answer this. And if you can actually, you know, um, also tell the year, that'll be absolutely amazing. Let's see who can get this answer. I'm just approximately going to give you just 30 seconds. Okay, we got few, few answers. And I'm also actually able to follow, follow them. That's really good. Excellent, uh, people likely have, yeah. If any of you can actually tell the, uh, the uh, you know, year, we don't actually have to have a month or the date, that would be, again, be fantastic. So just the year, uh, whoever is able to actually get the year of the introduction and has the right answer uh, gets the maximum points here. Uh, Dr. Tejkol has written his 2002 Desflurane, and that is probably introduction in, in uh, India. I'm uh, talking about introduction in clinical practice uh, across the world. So it could be anywhere, not in India. So this was not related to introduction of Desflurane or Super in India, uh, but as a as yet. Okay. So I think uh, the 30 seconds are over, and we are actually now uh, going to actually look at the answer. Okay. So the answer is actually desflurane. So the desflurane was introduced in clinical practice in 1987, uh, whereas sevoflurane was introduced in 1990 only. Okay, so three years later. But the reason why desflurane, uh, you know, it's not was not used as uh, commonly was it related to the cost, and the second was related to the vaporizer itself. So the vaporizer was a special vaporizer and it took time. So then the company actually decided, it says it decided that they would actually uh, start giving the vaporizers, um, you know, uh, free of cost. Okay, so as long as you bought X number of bottles of Desfluent every year, they got the Desfluent vaporizer free. So that was their marketing strategy. Okay. So that was a simple question. Okay. And now to coming to the, sec the second question of the day. So second question of the day, you need to recognize who this gentleman is and what is he making that is so important to us. Okay. So you can actually see that he's actually heating up something over the coal and is collecting the vapors or gas uh, you know, from whatever is heating. So uh, what is that? So if you can name the person and uh, what is it making? So there are two answers to it. So let's uh, see uh, what we got, okay. Uh, and the faculty, can I actually please ask everyone to actually keep themselves uh, muted? Uh, I don't know who Galaxy J7 Max is.
Okay, so you got you got another thirty seconds. Um, John Snow, John Snow, modern ether, ether. Um, modern John Snow, modern. Uh, it's actually much earlier than than that. Uh, so, I think I think it is a it's a difficult question because. Uh, we normally don't actually remember these spaces and it's especially uh, when these are actually part of paintings, they're not actual photographs. So it can be difficult to actually, uh, you know, know who it is. So I think uh, Arvind is there, this is John Presley. No, no. Okay, somewhere near to that, uh, what, uh, Presley did uh, somebody uh, excellent. I've got one answer, right answer at least. Um, Unum, you're right. Fantastic. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. So I think the time is over. Okay. The question uh, was again related to uh, him again. And what experiment, uh, so I'll give the both answers together okay, because related to the same person. Uh, what experiment did he actually ask his friends to perform at his death? Okay, that is actually a very morbid kind of a question, uh, but it is interesting. Now. So what experiment uh, did he ask his friends to, perf uh, to perform at his death? Uh, this will likely take little time for people to write, but we will likely wait and um, uh, see if anybody can answer uh, this question. So what experiment uh, did he ask his friends to perform at his death? This is the question three, guys. Anyone? I'm not seeing any answers at all. Okay. So I might actually have to move. If they are not seeing any, any answers, then I'll have to move. Somebody had written tooth ex extraction. No, that was not. As, <laughs> I don't know whether this was related to the uh, third question. <laughs> Experiment wanted during his death, you know, to ask him to extract tooth and find out whether it hurt him at his time of death. No, no, this is this is actually a, a, a quite an interesting um, question uh, he asked, or rather uh, the experiment he asked Tech to. So, okay, I think uh, this was a difficult one. So we will actually uh, move to the answer, okay. So this is uh, Lavoisier, okay, Antoine Laurent de Lavoisier. And uh, <clears throat> he was actually making oxygen, okay, here. So uh, whoever actually has said uh, oxygen, that is the answer is right. So Lavoisier actually, he died at age of 51 and uh, he was guillotined, okay. Uh, this actually happened uh, at the time of the uh, French Revolution. So uh, he used to uh, be um, investing in a private company and uh, this company used to collect taxes. And he was doing this uh, for uh, investing, uh, you know, for sort of funds for his research. So he wasn't doing to actually become rich he was doing it at, uh, to uh, fund the research. But unfortunately, uh, when the French Revolution happened, at that time, all the members of that, or whoever were investing in the private company uh, were charged with embezzlement and they were actually, you know, sentenced to death. So that actually brings to the third question related to this, uh, you know, Quiz question. 
So at the time when he was um, actually um, going to be guillotined, uh, what mm -hmm. he actually asked his friends, he said, uh, when the guillotine actually blade falls on his uh, head or his neck, uh, he will start blinking and they need to actually monitor for how long uh, after his head was severed, uh, he continued to blink. So basically his question was that how long will his brain continue to work after it has got separated from his body? And uh, he continued to blink, it says for 15 seconds. So that's the story behind uh, this gentleman. So from here, let's move on to a question. So if anybody has actually read my post today, we'll be able to answer this, okay? I wrote a post on uh, my uh, wall, Facebook wall uh, today, and um, it was related to this lady, okay? So this, uh, lady, she's an English novelist and diarist, uh, Fanny Burney. Uh, so she underwent a mastectomy for suspected breast cancer. I think it was a benign cancer and wrote about it. So what has this to go do with anesthesia? Okay. Was it to do with the general anesthesia, local anesthesia, or was it related to uh, inhalation anesthesia? Now, what was it actually related to? What did he write in our diary about the anesthesia? Oh, Preeti and Arvind, you guys actually have read my post today. <laughs> Excellent. All of you guys actually, it looks like you have actually read my post. Fantastic, excellent guys. Uh, this this was the quiz question now, uh, was uh, which inspired me to write about uh, my World Anesthesia Day uh, post today uh, on my wall. And uh, I think this is this is a very important uh, part of anesthesia. Okay. Uh, so, uh, like I said, she is a English. A novelist and diarist, and uh, she actually had the surgery without any anesthesia. So at that time, even alcohol was uh, used, uh, but uh, she even refused to actually have the alcohol or any kind of medicines uh, which would actually provide some kind of anesthesia. And then she actually wrote to her sisters, actually, the, this was in the letters. Uh, which have been now digitalized and they are actually available in the British Museum. So basically she, she you know, I, I can't believe how she would have actually uh, tolerated this uh, 20 minutes of the uh, surgery and um, no local anesthesia, nothing was given at all, okay. And uh, she says she fainted at least twice and um, you know, passed away without remembering anything. And this was not the only thing, even the dressings, you know, subsequent dressings were a suffering uh, for her. So there lies the important of, more importance of anesthesia. You cannot actually, uh, you know, perform any surgery without anesthesia, uh, whether it's a local anesthesia or it's a general anesthesia, uh, not remembering anything, being asleep, not having pain. These are all part of our anesthesia practice, uh, which are, uh, you know, despite our importance, uh, we are ignored. So moving on to question uh, five. So question five uh, is again, a, a, it's not a very clear thing, but then you're not, I'm not asking to you to identify the person. The lady sitting on the chair is Hannah Greener from Newcastle, England. And uh, uh, this image is from 28th of January, 1848. So there is a critical incident uh, mentioned in the literature related to her. What is it? So there is a, this is a multiple choice. So you will have to just write A, B, C, D. And as soon as I actually finish reading them, you need to actually 
uh, have the answers ready. Okay. So what's this critical insight about paralysis after spinal anesthesia? Was it drug reaction due to muscle relaxant or due to tuberculosis? Was it death from chloroform anesthesia or complication related to childbirth? I think a lot of people likely have got it right. Yeah. Excellent, guys. So, <laughs> a mother asked who will pay for the funeral. R and the R actually funny. Okay. So it couldn't have been spinal because um, spinal anesthesia. Uh, and it was described much later on uh, by August Bear. Okay. So this is not got anything to do with spinal anesthesia. Chivo curare was many, many years later. Okay. So it was uh, introduced uh, into anesthesia practice uh, by Canadian uh, anesthetist uh, Hall Griffiths in 1942. So it has got nothing to do with muscle relaxants. The, it has got nothing to do with maternal death because the first report of confidential acquiring maternal death or CMED um, was uh, published in 1957, uh, which covered the death between 1952 to 54. So it couldn't be. Okay, so now C, MED is now called Embrace. Okay, mothers and babies reducing risk through audits and confidential inquiries. Okay, so uh, C, CMED is now Embrace. And, you know, so. It was, uh, it was a chloroform death. Uh, first report of chloroform death, okay. Uh, there is obviously another story about the chloroform uh, commission related to Smania University and um, uh, from Hyderabad. So that's another story. So we move, move on to this lady. Uh, you need to identify the person and what did she develop that is named after her? I think this should be an easy one. There's a postage stamp, uh, which was released after her death, man, many years later. So let's see who can identify this person. Okay, um, I can give a clue. Uh, this is related with a uh, little bit with the uh, specialty we just discussed. By option C is over by Oh, fantastic. Arvind, you are too much. Priyanka, fantastic. Kapoor, fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. Absolutely. Virginia Apgar. That's right. Absolutely right. So uh, this is Virginia Apgar was uh, born in Westfield, New Jersey um, on 7th of June uh, 1909. And that's what it actually says on the stamp. Uh, so she lived from 1974. So it was in late 40s um, when she developed the scoring system, uh, which is named after her. And this was done uh, for evaluation of the newborn. Okay. Guys, uh, we need to actually who, who is there? Can they please mute? Uh, every, all faculty who are actually on this and uh, need to actually have themselves muted, please. Sorry, guys. Yeah. And so they then, uh, so this was, uh, came to know as the APGAR score and um, she presented uh, this in a meeting, sorry, it's going for us, in uh, September, 1952. And uh, the following year, that is 1953, the APGAR sis, uh, scoring system became known uh, through a publication. Okay, okay this is going to be a, another question. Let's see uh, who will get it right. So in our open drop ether, open drop chloroform. Um, so the first wireframe for administration of open drop chloroform was designed by uh, Thomas Skinner, uh, Schimmelbusch, uh, William Squire, or T. Jackson. It's an easy question, is it? Uh, 
<laughs> Thank you guys for actually taking part in this. <laughs> uh, some, some answers are very obvious, uh, but then if it was too obvious, maybe I wouldn't have put it here. Okay, I think that's enough. Uh, Vishnu Raj actually gets the answer right. So the only person who's got it right is Vishnu Raj. Okay, it was Thomas Skinner and uh, this is the Skinner's mask. Okay, either drop uh, mask. Uh, Skinner was actually from Liverpool. So he is from my city. So this is his mask, uh, which has been modified a little bit, okay. Uh, so this is this is the Skinner's uh, open drop mask. So uh, it was Thomas Skinner, and uh, he was a general practitioner obstetrician uh, from uh, Liverpool. And uh, at that time, uh, they weren't actually obviously there were no anesthetists, and uh, even GPs uh, were actually doing uh, general practitioners were doing anesthesia for the cases they were doing operating and everything. So in 1862, he actually designed this uh, wire frame uh, for administration of open drop chloroform. So it's just like actually, uh, uh, you know, like a ring with a handle and on which he actually put some clothes. Uh, later on, he actually added a few more clothes. Okay. So uh, uh, Shimal Bush uh, introduced his, uh, uh, the family of wire frame only in 1819. So quite a few years after, uh, uh, Skinner actually introduced uh, the open drop ethers. But I think uh, most people actually identify uh, Schimmel Bush, Bush with the uh, framework. Okay. So that's a Schimmel Bush mask. So that's so different uh, from the Skinner's uh, wire frame. Okay. And uh, this has got a handle. Okay. Uh, to hold. And there's another mask which actually looks similar to it. I could have put it as a quiz. Uh, but uh, let's not. So this is uh, Bellamy Gardner mask. And there is also a Bellamy Garden bottle as well. Um, that used to be asked in our uh, exams in the in the PG examination. So Bellamy Garden uh, bot bottle was also there. So they look very similar, except that in the Shimilush mask, there is actually a uh, handle. Uh, and in the Bellamy Gardner, there is no uh, you know, handle. Coming to question number eight. So question number eight is about what is this anesthesia apparatus? Okay, it looks like a bellow, but I don't think it's actually a bellow, but uh, there are actually a few things uh, which are uh, there, which might actually give you a clue. Any idea, guys? Okay. Uh, no, it's not Skinner. Absolutely, there is actually a mask and you can actually see there is actually kind of a corrugated tubing and um, it is, uh, there is actually a bellows-like thing. And what is interesting is that I think, which is not very visible here, is that the uh, bottle actually, um, is the, and the bellows are, they, they are actually connected to each other. Uh, so if you look at it, there is actually a glass bottle as well. And uh, you can actually see that on the top, uh, the, you know, there is, obviously something which you can connect. Uh, but these two, the, uh, you know, the wooden looking bellows and uh, that uh, uh, steel can, they are actually uh, connected almost together. Okay. Although this is not, this is not an Oxford bellow. Okay. I think this is going to be a little uh, tough question because this is related to, so this is a, a Clover's, a chloroform anesthesia machine and mask. Okay. So this was a Clover's one. Um, uh, keep this 
in mind a little bit because there will be another question uh, related to this in a minute. Uh, so this is this is Clover. So it is it is a early web prizes. So uh, pretty you can actually get one marks for this uh, because uh, I think in a way you're right. It is actually kind of a web prize early early web prizer. So the web prizer um, was actually the tin tin can. Uh, which is actually attached to the bellows. And the mask was again uh, used that. The, on the top is the, where the air inlet is. So it's like a, uh, you know, unidirectional valve uh, in there. So it's an interesting piece of. So coming to nine question, uh, what is this and what is it part of? Can it, so you can actually see there is, uh, it's like a mesh which can be expanded, you know? So uh, guess what is it part of? And what uh, could you think it could contain? The question seems to be getting a little bit harder now. Anyone, any idea what uh, this mesh or tube is like? It's not a stethoscope. It's not a stethoscope. It's again, um, like the, these questions are actually related uh, with uh, anesthetic gases. So it's. Uh, <laughs> it's not auction plush. Uh, it's not part of Boyle's bo uh, Boyle's machine or Boyle's bottle now. Okay. So this is again, I think uh, it's a tough question, and uh, uh, it's uh, not an extension as such, even though it is. It can be actually extended. Okay. So I will likely leave leave this uh, for you go. So uh, this is uh, Snow's, okay. John Snow's face mask for bottle and tube. So the, if you actually see that is a bottle and tube. Uh, so this is an inhaler for uh, chloroform anesthesia. And on the left side, you can actually see that is a place where uh, the upper part, upper part of that will actually go in and it'll screw in to that. And the bottle actually contains uh, the, um, you know, the chloroform. Uh, so this was Snow, John Snow's uh, uh, chloroform bottle. And uh, you can also call it a vaporizer uh, or inhaler as they were called, these were called inhalers. This is part of the uh, chloroform inhaler. Okay, so it is a kind of a vaporizer, so what they were called inhalers. Okay. What about uh, this apparatus? It's it is a uh, it is very obvious uh, obvious kind of a apparatus. But uh, let's see uh, if people will actually give it a name. They were you're right, Prithi. I think a lot of these patients were actually done. So if you look at it, the uh, most of the early anesthesia part was mainly. Uh, for dental extractions or just for pain relief. Uh, they weren't actually used for any major surgeries. Uh, and so, yes, they were anesthetized in a sitting position. So if you actually see some of the uh, historical books, uh, you will actually see Clover and Snow and these guys uh, using, um, you know, uh, anesthetizing patient in a sitting position. And many a time they were not even fasted. Yeah, you're very right, right. So what about this? This is not a filter. This is not filter quality. Uh, the, like I said, uh, this is actually uh, related to the previous question, not the one, not Snow's, the previous ones, except that the agent actually is a different uh, one used. It's not a filter. It's not an early filter.
No, uh, guys, I have said um, it is. It is a. It's a mask with a web browser. Yeah. So, um, any guess uh, what would this contain? Ether. Yes. Yes. Clover's inhaler. Portable. Arvind, you're right. Absolutely right. So this is Clover's ether inhaler. Uh, Dennis is also right. So. This is actually the Clover's. This is Clover's portable ether anesthesia apparatus, you know, such as uh, a small apparatus here uh, for uh, thing. So you can actually see on the right, the rusted part, and that is uh, from where you uh, he could actually keep adding um, the uh, ether through that. So this is uh, Clover's portable. So <laughs> like you have people have portable boils. This is his uh, portable ether anesthesia. Apparatus. Okay, excellent. Arvind and Dennis, I think um, both of you actually got the answer right. So as ether was introduced, and uh, they realized that ether actually causes fire. It's it's a flammable agent. That was one. It was an excellent anesthetic anesthetic agent, but also it was an agent which actually uh, led to fires. Okay, anywhere there were sparks you know, it could actually catch fire. So ether was very highly flammable agent. So first fire under ether anesthesia is, was recorded in the year 1800, 1850, 1910, or 1923. Just A, B, C, D, just whatever you want to put. Wow. Guys, you guys are amazing. Absolutely amazing, guys. Absolutely amazing. Yes, it was 1850. The answer is absolutely right. So 1850, the uh, first, uh, you know, uh, fire under ethyl anesthesia was in 1850. Uh, this should be simple to actually answer, but this first part is easy. The second part might be a little bit difficult. So the Association of Anesthetists of Great Britain and Ireland, which has now been renamed as Association of Anesthetists, just as simple as AOA. So this was founded by Henry Featherstone in 1932. And if you actually look, the motto of uh, the um, association was in somno securitas. So what is the meaning of uh, this? Uh, and uh, what, what is the meaning of this? And uh, so in 1932 or in 1930 at the similar time, uh, what were the other two important things related to anesthesia that happened? Any idea of that? So I'll give you a little bit of more time uh, for this. Uh, answer okay i need to actually have the right translation of that latin word okay Vanilla, you are absolutely right. Okay, but what about the other two questions? Okay, Teju, you're right, absolutely. So Teju actually got it right. It's sectometonium and pethidine. So Teju, you are absolutely right. So what was, uh, uh, I would actually further qualify this question and ask, so what was succinamethonium? Was it used for intubation at that time? Or was it actually uh, used for something else? Absolute treating tetanus, fantastic, okay. Okay, guys. So the um, absolute right translation of that is safe in sleep, okay. 
So it is not safety in sleep, but it is uh, safe in sleep. That's what uh, it translates to. And in the same year, patherin was introduced. Okay. And succinamethonia was first used uh, by uh, Dr. Reynard West to treat tetanus and patient with uh, muscle spasticity. So it was not used for intubation. Succinamethonia was used to treat tetanus okay, in patients. So it's interesting, isn't it? So it was not discovered, or rather it was not you know, used for intubation at that time. Yeah. A simple question, uh, all of you uh, would have used uh, the uh, jackson reese modification of air TPs. So air TPs was nothing uh, but an open-ended tube, okay, and the mask, so there was no back to it. And he introduced this circuit in 1937. Now, Jackson Rees uh, was anesthetist uh, again from Liverpool. Uh, the Alder Hay Pediatric Anesthesia Department is actually named after him. So, Alder Hay Jackson Rees Department of Anesthesia, Pediatric Anesthesia. So, he added an open ended back uh, to the expiratory limb to facilitate manual ventilation or controlled ventilation. It also, you could also make out this morning the respiration on that as well. So after how many years of uh, AIRS TPs uh, did Jackson Reese modify it? Was it after three years, after five years, after 10 years, or after 13 years? I'll give you a second, guys, to. Fantastic, the answer is out, guys. So Apurva actually has, has got the answer right. Okay, so 13th question uh, was, uh, answer was 13 years, and absolutely right, it was in 1950, okay. Um, so uh, Thomas uh, Philippeer, so the uh, invented a simple metal T piece to which he attached a six to 10 inches of open-ended red uh, tubing. So it was not a, a tubing like that. And um, uh, the distal end as a reservoir, so the tubing actually as a, as a reservoir, and uh, there was no valve um, or reservoir to this. So the the dead space was minimal because it was a T-piece, the oxygen was delivered uh, next to the uh, patient and it had uh, least resistance to breathing and was minimal. And so it was uh, 13 years later in, in 1950 that Jackson Reese added an open ended back to the expiratory limb uh, to facilitate manual control ventilation. So uh, uh, that is that it became uh, the F, isn't it? So uh, in Mapleson's classification uh, it is uh, is uh, circuit F. Okay, so is uh, the air STPs. Okay. Right, so identify these needles. Uh, what were they used for? Here's one, I think I moved the slides a bit early. It got moved accidentally and they got the answer. So. It's okay, we'll leave this answer. <laughs> we'll not consider this as part of the grid. All right, so what are these needles and what were they used for? These are ancient ones. They are not actually, uh, this is from a museum. Uh, covered, covered that with our logo because uh, if you actually 
knew which museum is from probably might actually get the answers right. So, um, if I gave you the clue, then it's it's from a branch of anesthesia, so it's not exactly related to anesthesia. Uh, we could also call it as an alternative part of medicine. Uh, no, these are not. Absolutely. So it's not bone marrow needles, not interosseous needles. Bupinder actually has got the answer right. Yep. Palo has got it right. Okay, these are actually, um, uh, these are acupuncture needles. You're absolutely, absolutely right. And uh, so these were made of uh, steel uh, needles, you know, sewing needles, and uh, the handles were actually made of ivory. Mm -hmm. So this, that's why they look off-white. So they are the ivory handles. And these are steel needles. So these are actually uh, acupuncture, ac acupuncture region. Not acupressure, the lungs, this is acupuncture uh, needles for uh, treatment of acupuncture. Absolutely right, yeah. So that was a clue that it's not to anesthesia, it's alternative mm -hmm. branch of anesthesia, or you can actually say that they are actually related to a, uh, you know, a specialty, which is also anesthesia, which is actually pain uh, medicine. Okay. Uh, coming to question number 15. Okay, so last five or six questions before uh, we actually have to crack on uh, in next 12 minutes. Uh, so what is the connection of anesthesia with this plant? Okay, so obviously all of you know that uh, this is uh, the venous trap. Okay, but what is the connection with anesthesia? What does anesthesia go to do with the venous trap? Atropine is not right, no, no, not atropine. Venus trap doesn't produce atropine. This is not atropic belladonna. Neuromuscular block, no. Curare, no. Paralyzing the prey, no. No, curare is not the answer. Neuromuscular block is not an answer. Atropine is not the answer. Uh, no, 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 doesn't resemble the Tura. <laughs> uh, anesthetic agent, if I have a fact, what anesthetic agent? Asphyxia. <laughs> ether, what ether uh, punam? Okay, I think it'll be difficult to actually write the full answer here, uh, but I think Dennis and uh, Punam actually got it uh, right. Uh, it was to do with, okay, so this is to do with uh, an experiment by uh, Darwin, okay. So <laughs> naturalist Charles Darwin. Um, so he was actually investigating anesthetic effects uh, on the this botanical uh, carnivores. And he tried using chloroform and ether. And uh, he was able to actually, when he actually gave uh, ether to the, uh, you know, the fly trap, the Venus fly trap, and it wouldn't actually wake up or it became insensate for almost 24 hours. <laughs> so they, so it, he was actually putting it in a vessel and then putting in ether and then various duration of exposure, 20 minutes, 15 minutes, and look at, and look at it. So obviously he was able to actually see that it was, uh, <laughs> you know, does actually have effect on uh, plants as well. So that's a interesting uh, thing. Okay, so in a way, they, so the answer by Puna was right. So it was uh, ether 
uh, and chloroform as well, but it was mainly uh, ether uh, which uh, he exposed uh, this plant to. Some next few questions are on some interesting uh, inventions uh, which we don't see them, but they have been published. Okay. So, any guesses? What is this invention, and what was it used for? Okay. This is a this is an old invention, and um, if we can actually see, the patient is on a chair. Uh, so, must be related to uh, something to do with uh, dental kind of a thing. So what is what is um, this invention for, or what is it? Uh, this invention. <laughs> Googly bowly. <laughs> it was difficult. Yes, I think even I would have failed. Somebody actually gave me the. If I had not read, even I wouldn't have got the answers. So it's fine, guys. It's easy to be in an examiner. Um, it's not actually tags. Dennis actually got it right. Okay, so restraint for patients. Why restraint for patients, Dennis? Why? Why were they actually trying to restrain? <laughs> uh, not for ECT. Not for ECT. Not for ECT. <laughs> no, they weren't trying to tie them to dental anesthesia chair and do it without anesthesia. <laughs> no, they were actually, okay. I think we need to move on uh, quickly. So uh, this was actually patented by Jacob Lazari. So this is also known as the anesthesia apron. Okay. So uh, Dennis was absolutely right. These were designed to restrain patients um, who are emerging from the excitement phase of nitrous oxide anesthesia in dental chairs. So this is dental chair. So this was also known as Lazari's uh, anesthetic apron. And um, this was used uh, for, because they would actually get very excited, they bang their head and you know, even some patient had fractures and uh, psychological trauma. Uh, so previously they used to just strap it uh, with a, like belts, leather straps and things. So this. Uh, was a, a simple one. Next one is actually a lot more interesting one. Um, this never actually got a patent, uh, but it's an interesting concept. And I can tell you one thing, a similar concept was actually used uh, by the Russians uh, in a hostage crisis. Okay. So what has this got to do with uh, anesthesia? What exactly is this. It's not the hyperbaric chamber. <laughs> it is not for interrogation. Uh, it's not a Bernoulli's phenomena, but though it does look like that, but it's not a Bernoulli's phenomena. <laughs> I gave, gave you, it's not an iron lung. It's not an iron lung. It's not a patient warmer. A fentanyl fumes, uh, that was what Russians use it, Dennis. <laughs> An injector principle of vaporizer, it could be at least said something like that, okay. <laughs> No, this will be very, because this is all uh, now the thing, but I think I will likely give give that uh, uh, marks to Dennis and um, Jai Sri also actually I think um, would actually get get that answer. Okay, this is actually a submarine. If you look at it, it's a submarine. Can you actually see the submarine, guys? No, sir. Neither you're not supposed to actually have your mic on. You're not, nobody's, nobody from faculty is participating in this. 
Okay. So this this is uh, by a guy called Wheaton. Okay. So he actually uh, you know had this idea that with this uh, submarine uh, could actually uh, you know we could actually sort of put a pin into a ship. We go for underwater uh, without them realizing. Do that. And we actually inject anesthetic into the engine room or the boiler room, and then it will all the gas will actually spread, and uh, everybody will become anesthetized, and they could capture the whole uh, ship without actually fighting any war. Uh, unfortunately, he never actually got this patented. It was never. Uh, he kept, I think, uh, you know, repeatedly going year after year to the patent office, but they never actually, uh, you know, entertained this idea. So uh, this is there. So it's a sub. <laughs> um, it's a submarine uh, where it would actually drill a hole uh, into the uh, you know the engine room or the boil room and send anesthetic gases into the patient. Last few question: uh, What kind of airway is this? It looks like something, but that's why I actually put it, but it may not be. It's an airway, guys. And like a, if you actually look at it, it's like a trumpet. And this has actually been from a museum and uh, that's why it looks like that. It's not actually uh, got that. And there's a pharyngeal airway that looks like a very obvious thing. No, it's not a tracheostomy tube. Early Goodles. Uh, you could actually say that. Okay, so I'm not. I'm going to actually move a little bit uh, quicker now because we haven't got uh, much time. Um, so this is actually an air. Uh, this is actually an oral airway, not a Goodles airway. So this is called Havertz airway and. Um, it wasn't actually introduced through the nose. Uh, it was an oral airway. And uh, you're right that um, they were then again made into different shapes and made of different material. Um, you know, then they became like plastic and Goodall's airway probably. This is a precursor to Goodall airway. The next one is also an, an airway, um, which looks like an airway you are all familiar with, uh, but it isn't. So what kind of airway is this one? And I just want one answer, don't want, uh, look at it carefully. It has actually got something uh, very unique. And uh, if you can actually guess it, uh, that person should be called a winner. So what, uh, it looks like a good old survey, but it's not. So I've given that answer to you. But what is special about this airway? It's not for fiber optic, it's not for, and this is not a water spray, right? So, so we come come to the next next question, next uh, thing. Uh, no, Bupinda, this is not uh, water airway. You don't have to actually name it. You don't actually have, need to know this name. Uh, I want you to look at it closely and actually see that there is something very unusual about it or something, what can you exactly do with it? Arwen, you got it right. It looks like a Homo sapien, that's very uh, right. I would have actually called it a Homo sapien. And this is, Arwen, you're, you're absolutely right. This is actually, uh, it's got something which I can move. So uh, this is uh, called what makes uh, expanding airway. So this is an expanding airway. And this was patented in 1938. Um, and this is, this is an autopharyngeal airway as well. So this was, this is actually, you can, so if you actually look on the top, uh, there is actually a thing which you can move up and down and it actually opens. So two flanges actually open. So you can actually see a hinge uh, on the on the top, there is a hinge. So it is actually uh, opens up, okay. Uh, last uh, two, uh, what is a special glove? Okay. 
and uh, what is it used for? Uh, so if people who have been on this uh, group, our Facebook group for a while, uh, would be able to identify this. I had posted this quite a few years back and um, just one you know, little thing about it would be fine. Um, I'm not looking for a big answers. So the next two questions are actually have been on the group uh, for a while. So what is this special glove? What is those wires running and uh, stuff like that? And have you have deliberately given two, two pictures? But yeah, stop, uh, now the airway is gone. Talk about uh, this one. What is this special glove for? It's not for playing LM. <laughs> no. <laughs> what will the wires do with LM? <laughs> okay, again, uh, this is actually related not to anesthesia, but a specialty related to anesthesia. And no, it doesn't monitor the uh, abdominal pressure, uh, stimulate on a pharynx. Uh, please go to the other end. <laughs> so I actually showed you. <laughs> it doesn't stimulate pharynx. It does stimulate from the other end. Dennis, I won't put it in the map. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, pretty. <laughs> like the temperature with a glove. <laughs> I'm enjoying the <laughs> pure glove. temperature. No, no. Okay, okay. I will answer. I think this is this is great. But they show that finger. Say where could finger actually go? Okay. So this is actually a pitonal nerve distal more uh, uh, the pitonal nerve more monitoring. Okay, so um, pitonal nerve injuries can happen during childbirth. And uh, so um, this, this is actually uh, a electrode system uh, which was uh, invented by uh, two people from uh, St. Mark's Hospital in London uh, called Kiff and Swash. So this is also known as the uh, St. Mark's uh, pitonal nerve stimulator, okay. So this is, this is how it is actually. So you can actually see that there are two electrodes at the tip and two actually at the surface uh, separated by around four centimeters. And it's mounted on a finger, that's why it's a glove. And then uh, you do can do PR, okay? And um, you can also be transvaginal as well. So you actually place uh, your fingertip at the atrial spine and that's where the pitonal nerve is uh, running and you do electrical stimulation and look at the latency response, okay? So this is actually for detecting the, uh, you know, pitonal nerve injuries uh, in patients, okay? Uh, last question of the day. Okay. This again has been discussed. Okay, what does this syringe contain? Last question, yay. Profol cyclopropane, no guys. If you have been on this group and you have uh, you know, gone through my quiz questions, this question has been on the group.
<laughs> profile methyl, no. No. Interlipid, no. Lipid emulsion, no. Last treatment, no. <laughs> this will surprise you guys. Let's see if we can get it. So we're almost ready to start off our second. Uh, Anand, Anand, you are the winner. Anand, you are the winner. Fantastic. Okay, so this is actually uh, is a lipid lipidic oxygen microparticle or LOM. Okay, and so these microparticles are used to package oxygen. Right. So uh, what happens is that when uh, these uh, microparticles come in contact with deoxygenated blood, they will release the oxygen. Okay. And the lipid uh, shell can be metabolized, so it will also produce uh, energy. And uh, it's not a substitute uh, for uh, blood, okay, but it's only for increasing the oxygen availability. Okay, so you can you know, keep them alive for 15, 30 minutes and give them time, okay. So what it does, it basically, it allows to uh, carry almost three to four times uh, the oxygen content of a red blood cell. So it is actually for providing oxygen. So this is like a, a delivering intravenous uh, oxygen. Okay. So uh, Anand, you are actually absolutely right and uh, that these are oxygen microcapsules. And uh, so you are the winner. Anand Kortgeri, fantastic. All right, guys. So with this, we end our uh, quiz. And thank you for uh, watching this. And uh, the next uh, part of the, you know, the our uh, 